it's true. Hello, hello. So finally. How are you? Fine, thank you. Hello, thank you, thank you. How are you? So finally. Yeah. Fine, having a bit of turmoil here politically. <laughs> I, yes, I know, I know. I'm following what's happening in Belgrade. Uh, I'm very sorry, sorry just, what's happening. Just a, second, yes. just a second, sir. I would like to start uh, recording. Okay. Okay. Uh, would you would you like to, sh to to split the screen, left and right? Yeah, maybe yes. you can do that. Maybe yes. that would be better. Mm, here. Let me speak with you. Uh -huh. Here. Here, I think it is much better. Okay. Uh, hello. I, I worked as a technical guy. I made a mistake. I put the wrong numbers uh, in the invitation. So excuse me for, for that. Okay. So no, no, it's all right. we, go, it's all right. we can go in the conversation. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, I wanted to ask you about your process of writing a book. I think that would be very interesting for your readers here. Okay, so first of all, добро вечер. Извинявам се, што не говорим српска, али ви омас сам захвална што е моја книга на српски привела поштована Андија, а драги Сарџан објавил. Ако е згодно, могу да говорим руски или англиски. Англиски. Well, I'd rather translate from English than from Russian. Okay. Russian is. Okay. Learned Sorry five, about 90 that. days of being a tourist guide to a Russian theater group, and that's all I know about. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, in regards of this particular book, uh, in uh, because I've I wrote this book uh, quite uh, a while ago, you know, it was immediately after the, uh, you know, the 9 uh, 11 attacks, basically. Uh, it came to me, you know, uh, in one sort of go, in a way. So I was always pre preoccupied with the uh, idea uh, that Turkic people, when I call Turks, uh, they are not the uh, sort of equivalent of uh, Turks of today, but Turkic people, wider. The Turkic people, they followed all the religions of the world. Shall I give you time to translate or shall I go just? Sergeant, do we need to translate now or we can do maybe the, maybe I could type later. Yes, I, th I think it's better. Sure. Because so we're we'll just we'll... going to have a conversation in English and then okay. we'll put the Chiron yeah. because it will be so Okay, yeah. yeah we will so in that uh, case, much, much time. Okay, so in that case, so uh, the, I was always preoccupied and fascinated by the idea that Turkic people, they followed all the religions of the world. You know, in their history, you can find uh, the sutras has been uh, being translated. Uh, you can find the Christian uh, manuscripts have been tr translated. You find the, the, you know, Buddhist, you can find Manichaean, you can find the Zoroastrian things uh, being translated into Turkic languages, and uh, naturally the uh, uh, Muslim Islamic as well. So basically, you can find anything in Turkic languages in the history of Turkic people. And that was a kind of, you know, a puzzle for me why these people followed all the religions, why they were so tolerant to uh, follow all these religions of the world. Uh, and little by little, I started to think about the sort of, you know, one event uh, which would bring uh, all these religions together. And I came up with a fictional sort of, you know, fictional uh, idea when I brought all the religions of the world together at the funerals of, uh, of uh, Kultegin, uh, one of the princes, one of the heroes of uh, Celestial Turks. So, and this book, uh, especially after the, you know, after the 9-11, uh, when the world all of a sudden became black and white, you know, either you are with us or not with uh, or against us, 
So that was my response, that you can follow all the religions, you can be tolerant to the extent that you want to bring all the people uh, of the world together. So that was my fictional response to 9-11. Thank you. It was, an, uh, it was a wonderful experience translating this book, and I have to say, like no other in 40 years, and it, I think it's going to be my favorite book for a very, very long time. Unless Thank I, you, Andre. Thank you. <laughs> unless I get to tr translate that, well, then, then we'll see. <laughs> um, so, um, how much research did you have to do for this book? Or was it just familiar? Because you are also related to some historical facts and artifacts, which are mostly unknown in this part of the world. Uh, yes, uh, as far as the, the you know, Turkic part of the uh, things, I was quite, uh, you know, knowledgeable of that part because, uh, because, because I was interested in the, the history of uh, Turkic people, uh, in the history of uh, Or Orhon and Yenisei, and uh, sort of, you know, runic uh, sort of inscriptions. So I was very much in it. But uh, when I decided to find a form for that one, you know, as you, uh, as you have seen while translating, uh, so people are sort of immersing into the history. They are representing different cultures, different uh, faiths, different religions as well. So uh, then I started to look into sort of, you know, uh, different faiths and different religions as well. So that was my research mostly about, you know, for example, about Judaism, about the Zoroastrianism. But uh, generally, it's a fascinating area which, uh, which I was interested all my life in. The first book that I read that you wrote was a railway. And I was absolutely fascinated by railway, but I also, when Surajan asked me to think about translating things that, and I saw that the translator felt the urge to write 34 pages about translation. I said, maybe we don't do that as a first one. <laughs> so uh, could you maybe tell us more about the process of, uh, tr that the translators go through when translating your books? I assume they're all quite a challenge. <laughs> Uh, very recently, quite recently, I discovered that I'm not making the life of my translators easy at all, you know. Uh, it was with my latest book, which has been translated by Donald Crayfield into English. And when, uh, you know, he gave me the first, uh, uh, the first draft, all of a sudden I realized that what I was doing in Uzbek, uh, making catacombs of the sentences, you know, because for me, challenge is right in my own language to uh, sort of, you know, to discover new uh, possibilities, new opportunities for the language, new challenges for the language, to adopt it to the reality which I am imagining. And therefore, I'm not thinking about the translators as such. And I was horrified, you know, in what situation I'm putting my translators, uh, sort of, you know, going and browsing in these catacombs for the sense, you know, in the catacombs of my sentences, for the sense. Because generally, the Turkic languages, they are quite, uh, sort of, you know, quite... Uh, difficult uh, and complicated because you are putting, uh, you know, the verb at the very end in Uzbek, you know, and until you reach the whole sentence, you don't understand in which uh, sort of, you know, uh, in which uh, so in which modality it ends, for example, is it the question, is it the statement, is it the exclamation, is it the uh, past tense or the future tense. So you have to get to the very end of the sentence, like in German, let's say, yeah, in order to make sense of the sentence. But my sentences are overcomplicated in Uzbek. 
I am always sort of challenging my Uzbek readers, you know, uh, leaving them in a sort of, you know, in a limbo, you know, to trying to guess where I'm going with this sentence. And when I realize that I'm by default making the life of my translators uh, so horrible, all of a sudden I realized that, uh, you know, uh, I have to appreciate my translators so much for their work, especially when they are translating from from Uzbek or Russian for the same argument. Yes, so they, they, they did a great job to make my job easier. For yeah. I'm very grateful. In a way, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and um, as you mentioned, Uzbek and uh, how was it being an author and an author of such a broad view under the dicta dictatorship and oppression? How was it writing your books while you were there? You know, partly, I must say that partly the sort of, you know, my destiny made me what I am, maybe, you know. When I was uh, living in Uzbekistan, what I noticed, uh, looking at my sort of, you know, at my uh, biography of myself, you know, at my life and career, I was mostly about, uh, you know, Western cultures, mostly. Uh, in a hippie culture, let's say in my youth or whatever, you know, listening to rock music uh, and so on and so forth, you know, translating people like Berlin, Rimbaud, for example, into Uzbek, yeah, Lorca, so the modern poetry, let's say, which was considered modern at the time, we haven't uh, get the access to beatniks or whatever, like, uh, like Kerouac or others. But what we considered being modern was the 19th century modern poetry, or the beginning of the 20th century. So I extensively translated them into Uzbek, you know, bringing new language into Uzbek, considering that I'm bringing completely new sort of, you know, world into the Uzbek literature. Uh, I translated, for example, into Uzbek Mandelstam. Uh, his stone, his other poems, uh, and so on and so forth. So I was mostly about the sort of non-Uzbek cultures, let's say. But then we moved uh, to Moscow, you know, because uh, in uh, Soviet Union, everything was happening in Moscow. If you wanted to make a sort of writer's career or being noticed, you should have moved to Moscow. In Moscow, all of a sudden, I started to feel an Uzbek in a way, you know. Uh, by definition or by default, you know, I was calculating, for example, number of steps which I have to make in order, if, for example, the planes, they don't fly to Tashkent, so in how many days I can reach Tashkent, for example, you know. I started uh, the sort of, you know, the opposite thing. I started to translate the Uzbek classics, the Persian classics into Russian, sort of working on my own culture in a way, bringing it to uh, Russians and the Russian readers or the Soviet readers more widely. So uh, then, you know, by default, uh, we moved to France, we moved to Germany. So the, that was an opening then, you know, because I started to understand, you know, the Western cultures as well, uh, uh, in comparison to my own culture, to the Russian culture. So that was, in a way, you know, my destiny, which made me what I am today, in a way, you know. So I can't take all the credit to myself, you know. I was born with that one. No, it was in between, I think, between what I was born with and what uh, the life did to me. Yes, but I found very interesting was this... Uh very unusual combination of a very beautiful traditional storytelling and very modern topics and um, modern ideas intertwined together in a beautiful logical unit and i was absolutely i've never met anyone who writes the way you do i was totally in awe of your writing so would you say that all these things together uh and uh, this intersection of cultures that you had to live through, in, uh, did it uh, not influence just your writing, but also your language? Maybe, maybe, but uh, now when I'm looking, sort of, you know, uh, I'm very much interested now in my 
DNA, for example, yeah? <laughs> and, uh, funny enough, the other day I was discussing with my son our DNA, yeah? Because we are sharing the same genes in a way. So when I'm going to the, you know, uh, because people share uh, their sort of DNAs, yeah? At the, uh, at the particular, let's say, organization, yeah? Uh, ancestry.com, for example. When I'm going to my fifth, uh, fifth or sixth cousins, fifth grade or sixth grade cousins, yeah, it's basically about the fifth or sixth generation uh, ago. So I can find their you name, you know, Jewish people, black sort of, you know, uh, Americans, Australians. Baltic people, Lithuanians or Latvians, uh, then uh, Irish people, German people, Russian people, Czech people, all of them, they are my cousins, you know, in the fifth or sixth generation. And it's so amazing. I was reading their names to my son, you know, of my sixth cousins, yeah? And he was guessing who they are. From Japan to, uh, to I don't know, to um, New Zealand or to America or to Chile, for example, you know? So when we are looking into that kind of sort of, you know, uh, intersection and mixture, so it's so funny that we are sort of, you know, talking about our belongings to a particular race, a particular sort of, you know, nation or ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And especially with the modern world, uh, I was thinking because I was moving around and seeing people, uh, a friend of mine used to say, he was a genius, but uh, never wrote a book apart from one. And my latest book is about him, you know. He used to say, when you sort of pierce with a um, needle uh, anyone, everyone feels the pain, you see. So basically, all of, all of us, we are about the same pain, basically. The same happiness, the same pain. Yes, it's, it's a tragedy that we rarely see that and rarely yes. understand that we are all related and we are all necessary, I think, for this world. We are all contributing in one way or the other. Um, yes. Another question I had and I was very curious exactly because of reading your books was uh, how do you, what do you think about uh, contemporary Uzbek literature? What is your opinion or? Yes, uh, there are very talented, you know, people. Uh, I told once, you know, the, uh, this anecdote, you know, the, when uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize was given as the journalists thought to sort of unworthy people and so on and so forth, one French uh, journalist, very esteemed French journalist, wrote sarcastically in Le Monde, yeah? So next year we have to expect uh, that, uh, the, uh, that the um, Nobel Prize will be given to one uh, sort of obscure Uzbek writer because he lives under the sort of Karimov's dictatorship. And I was sort of quite offended by that one, you know, the, the dismissive character of the Uzbek literature. I consider, for example, that Uzbek uh, literature uh, has got at least five, six potential Nobel Prize winners, for example, you know, and nobody knows about those people. They are poets, they are good prose writers, they write wonderful prose, they write wonderful poetry, but the problem is that they have no access to the sort of, you know, to be translated, to be known, to be seen. Unfortunately, in this world, we have this problem of the small literatures in a way, you know. Nobody knows, for example, about, let's say, Grant Mativasyan, the great Armenian writer, let's say, or Otar Chiladze, great Georgian writer. The same used to happen with, uh, you know, with your part of the world, you know. Mm -hmm. Who knows about Mesha Selimovich, for example, you know, or uh, uh, luckily Eva Andrich was noticed, but you had so many wonderful writers, you know, never noticed, never noticed, because unfortunately there is this dictatorship of the 
big literatures, you know, three, two, four, three, two, four literatures like uh, English, like uh, German, like French one, and Spanish. And when you are looking, for example, which kind of books are translated into English, you notice that 70% uh, are French books, uh, another 20% are German books, and so on and so forth, you know. Chinese or Arabic, even the, the not talking about smaller nations, even the sort of, you know, bigger nations, which are uh, sort of, you know, beyond this uh, culture, they are really known, you know, in the West. Yes, unfortunately. I'm always offended when we write for European translation grants and then uh, they're encouraging us to translate from lesser languages or lesser what lesser literatures i don't why is it lesser what makes it lesser the number of people who speak it i find it really really wrong <laughs> not to well, say it is. it is wrong it is wrong yes and i i, I do feel um after it especially after reading devil's dance i feel uh, something has been taken away from me something that i would have loved to learn about by not being able to read such wonderful authors and, and not just not even not being able to read but never hearing about them never knowing and now thanks to you i've learned about one beautiful author from uzbekistan and how many wonderful authors all around the world that we'll never hear of and i think it's a tragedy for the world culture and i think surgeon wants to ask you something <laughs> so yes please. All right hello <laughs> my friend how are you Fine, thank you. How are you? I thank definitely you prefer much. to have you here instead of talking uh, to computer, but uh, something is better than nothing, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, I want to just tell you that we have uh, uh, organized the full month of uh, Central Asian culture here in our small joint. Karan Sarai and promotion of your book and uh, uh, conversation with you is a part of it, right? So Thank you. you. You're welcome. So a few days ago, one of my outputs on uh, Facebook and uh, on the social media around here was that the train is about to leave the station and those who doesn't want to dream, you know, like they can skip the train, but those who wants to dream, they can, it's the last chance to uh, jump in and start uh, rolling in a good uh, uh, direction. And then I underline saying, if you would like to meet uh, uh, people like Kumar Jiva, Lao Tse, Hamid Ismailov, Jovan Damaskin. So I kind of cover the whole range of uh, interesting characters during the last 2,500 years uh, from, let's say, Balkans to all the way to China, right? So we started with some films, with some uh, promotion of the poetry and the music here. And unfortunately we have this COVID situation, but people are paying attention. I can see they're paying more and more attention and they're discovering uh, on the way uh, through the photographies and films and your literature and other literature, discovering that beautiful part of the world. So my question for you would be, because we had yesterday here the guy who is kind of expert, young guy from Israel who grew up in America and he lived in China for a year and a half. He knows a lot about Asia, right? The Palestinian problem, we had some discussions. So yesterday we spoke about uh, uh, One Belt, One Road uh, uh, project. And uh, both of us are very enthusiastic and I think Anja now uh, and uh, Radisha and everybody around who's coming these days is getting uh, infected <laughs> with the good ideas about uh, finally uh, people getting together, at least through the vision, uh, and hopefully in 10, 20, 50 years getting together. So we mentioned uh, warriors periods of the time when the, the art was really on a high level 
in those territories, in Gandahara, in Kushan Empire, in uh, Abbasid, uh, uh, Sassanid Empire, in uh, like you, you name it, in Mughals and stuff. So all this month we're gonna start, uh, try to put those puzzles a little bit together so people have a wider idea. So the question for you is, because we don't have too many informations here coming about uh, the Silk Road these days, the new modern Silk Road. So uh, because we value you as an intelligent man and a knowledgeable man to give us an honest opinion about the whole that project. Uh, the political side of it is uh, kind of, uh, sort of, you know, it's quite uh, sort of, you know, uh, China-centric one. Yeah, kind of, it's understandable. China wants to become a center kind of, of that part of the world, and uh, it's understandable. Uh, what for cultural? Mm, uh, I don't know that there is the cultural kind of, sort of, you know, dimension to it. At least, you know, some people are trying to find the cultural dimension to it and do something, you know, uh, ch championing some kind of, um, uh, cultural ideas, including in China as well. I know it by my wife, you know, who is quite actively involved into the musical part of this uh, uh, sort of project of the Silk Road. It's not one belt, uh, but it's more about the sort of reviving the Silk Road tradition uh, uh, culturally. So the musical aspect of it was quite active and there are Chinese sort of, you know, institutions who are supporting this idea of bringing musicians together and so on and so forth. As for literature, it's less so. Uh, unfortunately, you know, literature is not becoming something uh, prominent uh, for uh, that part of the world. Though some countries are doing something, for example, uh, Kazakhstan is going to translate 200 volumes of uh, different sort of, you know, uh, classics, modern literature, so government is putting some money into it. Though how this money will be used is always the problem, you know, with our part of the world. Uh, there are sort of lots of schemes and so on and so forth, you know, who is choosing, uh, who is being published, who is going to translate it and so on and so forth. But at least it's something progressive. Uh, 200 volumes of uh, sort of Kazakh literature being translated into the different languages. So uh, there are some movements in Uzbekistan now as well to translate some of the literature, but mostly they are supported by uh, individuals rather than by the government or by the authorities. Unfortunately, for all our part of the world, literature is uh, something subversive for them, you know. They are considering it subversive because they are sort of, you know, allowing the classics or whatever in certain uh, sort of, you know, form. But as for the modern literature, they are considering it as a subversive element. Uh, why? Because whenever you are writing honestly about the reality, it's different to the reality which the sort of, you know, authoritarian regimes of our part of the world trying to mm, sort of, you know, to uh, propagate and trying to sort of manifest, you know, like we are living in the, the best part of the world, we are this and that, and so on and so forth. The reality is quite different to what they are trying to project. And the honest literature is showing that one. Honest literature is always existing and showing the reality as it is. And therefore, unfortunately, those people uh, are either forced to leave the, uh, the countries of their origin or write into the table and so on and so forth. I know many, many wonderful writers in all Central Asian countries who are not heard, unfortunately, by the world and by their readers. So our hope uh, is uh, when the people start moving freely, uh, number one, because I remember last time I was in Central Asia, I was there many times for the last time, and I was planning to go this summer, but this COVID situation stopped me, and hopefully it wouldn't stop me next year, because I miss my friends, my family. I also feel like uh, I came from that part of the world, 
I mean my jeans, yeah? Uh, because when I was there, I recognized uh, the costumes and uh, the habits uh, which my family here also have. And I, uh, you, I don't know how to say, but I feel comfortable over there, regardless <laughs> of all political uh, pressures and stuff. I didn't have a time to think about politics when I was in uh, Central Asia because my heart and my mind was filled up with uh, many beautiful things and uh, I, I desire more. So uh, uh, last time I spoke to some Uzbeks and Kyrgyz and Tajiks and Uyghurs and Dungans and they were all saying like, okay, uh, now we almost have democracies and stuff, but we cannot uh, move freely. All these borders, all these conflicts, like in the Soviet Union, at least we were moving freely. And I said, the next step would actually be when you guys, you know, finally all these uh, curtains fall down and then we start moving and you start exchanging uh, like uh, we did it before. And hopefully under the new, uh, the new, I, I don't want to say rule, but the new vision uh, where the technology will put us in position so we can go with a car or train. Chinese promise they're going to have a train running very fast in two days from Beijing to London. You know, so if, if I can stop by in, uh, in Tashkent or Bishkek, it's great. And hopefully uh, when the people start moving freely, they will connect uh, and also the riders, you know, because uh, we have people here coming. The other day, one uh, Moroccan young girl who wants to learn some Serbian, she came and she said, oh, I want to learn about Central Asian uh, art, you know, right here in Belgrade. And I was proud. And also some American guys came. And this Israeli guy, now he wants to go back to China and Central Asia. He said, I was never in Central Asia. I want to go back there. So more like uh, motivating people to travel and move freely, they're going to learn more about the art. And hopefully one day, uh, all those, uh, I mean, they're going to be old guys. Now they're younger writers are going to be, but you know, maybe they're kids. Uh, they go, they, they're going to start uh, getting recognition in in a wider wider world. Uh, you know, I was last year in America, in California, and I was hanging with the millionaires, you know. Uh, they live in a bubble, man. So we are finally coming to the point when this bubble might even uh, break. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, the burst. And it's going to be very hard, but it's going to be for good. Because finally, we're going to, you know, in, uh, finally we're going to experience all of that, you know, artificial uh, closure on uh, culture and spirituality. I think the spirituality and uh, the knowledge, the real knowledge about, the, uh, let's say, races and, uh, and the human knowledge will come up to the surface and we will start, you know, like in the good direction. But uh, I think will be, in order to get better, we'll get worse first. So what you know, you're saying, especially about the movement, is very, very sort of you know the, uh, absolutely right about the movement. I I, I have an anecdote uh, in my life. You know, several years ago, a very good friend of mine, a very famous journalist, came to see me. You know, saying you know the mm, newspaper is uh, is trying to send me to Uzbekistan. But I don't want to go to Uzbekistan because it's a dictatorship, or could, uh, as if I'll be promoting the dictatorship, you know. Uh, the newspaper was sending her for the touristic sort of, you know, piece, yeah, about Samarkand, about Bukhara, and so on sure. and so forth. And I said to her, you know, you must go. The more you go, because you are not going to, for the sake of these dictators or whatever, you are going to help those people. The more you open this part of the world, the better, you know. And she was so relieved and so happy to go there. Sure. And she, she came with wonderful sort of peace, you know, about people rather than di the dictators or whatever. Sure. Uh, I've got always the sort of, you know, the uh, metaphor for that one. In a stuffy room, when you open the windows, you know, the wind is coming or draft is coming and it's becoming fresh air, you know. Sure. So the more you move, the more you bring the ideas, the more you bring people. People, the fresher the stuffy room becomes, in a way. Yeah. So let me, if you don't mind asking me, uh, asking you, uh, like it might sound political, but I would like to know uh, uh, what's going on in Uzbekistan right now. 
this guy who uh, in inherited the power after Islam Karimov, uh, we don't know nothing about him. There, there is no profile in any papers. It's uh, all hush. You see him with the Putin on a big parade, and that's it. So uh, Uzbekistan is a big country. It's a beautiful country, and it could be a very powerful country in the region because it has a culture. And uh, you know, uh, for centuries, it was just on the way center of of the the culture. So what's what's going on right now? Well, what's your perspective? Yeah, so generally, I mean, there were lots of positives when the, the person comes to power, he is intending to do lots of things. So there were positives, like, for example, opening the borders with the neighboring countries, especially with the Central Asians. Yeah, then uh, the, the freedom of speech was sort of, you know, uh, on rise as well. You know, lots of bloggers appeared, lots of this and that. But the most depressing thing is always with our part of the world, you know, despite of education, despite of intentions, despite of background, despite of anything, unfortunately, when people come to power, they start to act in a similar manner, you know, they start to consolidate their power because they're afraid that if they are not strong, so they will be overturned, yeah. They get rid of all sort of, you know, enemies or hostile sort of elements will get around them, sort of including the opposition, yeah, good, bad, or whatever opposition. They try to make lots of money or their families and their close people could try to make lots of money taking over the businesses of the old sort of, you know, presidents and all parties. Unfortunately, all of them, they act in the similar manner, you know, whichever country you take. It's a sad... Apparently, it's the sort of, you know, these are the rules of the politics or whatever, you know, especially in the countries where there are no sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, where there are no uh, civic societies, basically. Uh, where the, the press is not strong enough to sort of pull, uh, hold them to account and so on and so forth, you know. Mm -hmm. That is the problem for every country in Central Asia. It, it seems like it's a problem for every country around the world now, my friend. Because, uh, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe. Yeah, well, it seems like uh, we, we are approaching some kind of uh, techno-feudalism, you know, like... Uh, yes, but uh, at the same time, you know, in the West, you've got the, the checks and balances, you know. I always give the, the example of uh, President Obama not being able to close Guantanamo, for example, you know. Uh, it seemed very small thing, but the, because of the check and balances, he, could, he, he didn't succeed even to, to sort of, you know, to close Guantanamo. Yeah, well, that, that's why I mentioned the, the one belt, because for me, maybe I'm a, a dreamer. For me, uh, at least there was the international uh, idea uh, where uh, uh, it will be some ultimate check on uh, on the local uh, usurpators, you know. Hopefully, one day it will be one umbrella. We used to say when I live in London, I used to hang with uh, Caribbeans, and we used to say one law, one love, one destiny. And uh, <laughs> you know, and every I, I, it seems like it's all over again. Uh, very uh, like uh, potent that uh, expression, and people should believe in that. Uh, uh, but. You know, with, with all this technological might, it seems we are more divided, you know, because right now uh, uh, in, in Belgrade, there is a curfew again. We had an amazing riot two nights in, in a row. I never seen young people being so uh, 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 violent and also police being uh, almost like a robotic, you know, with Milosevic, I I at least you could tell the policeman like, okay, show him a... Uh, a middle finger and he will curse on you. But now, you know, it's just straight to the business, like uh, kicking each other's uh, arse and like, uh, you know, like they have uh, so many people injured. Uh, so that shows the situation this world is, is getting almost frantic. As I said, the bubble is about to explode because the, the leaders, they don't understand 
anymore. They're so uh, uh, high in their like uh, uh, like our, our Mr. President is right now in Paris talking to Macron, who is already discredited by his own people. But you know, obviously they can talk uh, 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 business how uh, to actually square even more uh, the people's uh, uh, ability to get together and live together, right? So I am very skeptical about this garden, uh, how, how I would say, this, this, the whole European, you know, like uh, 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 political uh, uh, nobility, because uh, at this point they're not working on a level to put us to live together. I mean, they're putting us against each other and it's uh, spreading all over in, uh, in, the, 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 in Africa, in Asia. So who's gonna take care of uh, the business? Us, people, exchanging more information, literature, poetry, talking to each other and trying to co uh, convince the leaders, you know, the life is not just about uh, grabbing the money and, you know, dreaming about the power. Uh, as I said, I was in California last year and uh, in Santa Barbara, which is probably the richest place on the uh, planet, uh, they have a white big sharks coming to breed there. And they were all surprised. Why? Because uh, down in the Mexican Gulf is warmer. I said, they feel the, the, they feel the greed. They're coming over here because they feel comfortable. And uh, guess what, guys? The lawyers can swim freely. And they say, why? Because the sharks they feel professional courtesy. They're not going to ask. They're not. They're not going to attack the lawyers. So they they were looking at me like, "Oh, you are. You don't believe in the system." I said, "I do believe in the system, but not in a system when you protect only rich uh, people." So uh, the time I am very appreciable with your books because, among the other cultural things, we also read some kind of uh, which is very common for your part, the part of the world you're coming. That kind of uh, uh, expression, literature expression, who are giving you strength to uh, fight, you know, not necessarily with uh, with arms, but with your like uh, with your spirit, you know, to to uh, continue to you know, to f try to find a way to find the niche where you can implement your ideas, the fresh ideas, the the, the good ideas for people to rise and live. Uh, together. I, I don't want to mention historically who came. The people are surprised. They think uh, we had the revolutionaries here in the last two, three hundred years. No, I tell them, you know, like you go to the history, you'll find people fighting for the rights in, uh, in, 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 in Asia from, you know, uh, from Istanbul to, to Beijing, like so many of them, you know, like so many of them fighting and sacrificing, you know, trying to, uh, you know, pull people to the better better living. And uh, we are looking forward, obviously, to translate more of your books and promote them. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. Uh, the, uh, for, for your information, more people know about you and your art. And my job will be in a year to come, inshallah, uh, to promote that because it's an extreme pleasure. So Thank you very much. If, uh, if uh, Anja has another question or something, uh, and Thank then we you. can uh, wrap it up. We don't want to hold you. Okay. Uh, we know you're very busy. So. No, I'm not okay. going to ask you anything else, but I just want to thank you and ask you to please keep on writing. <laughs> <laughs> I have to thank you for your wonderful translation. Today I received the book, you know, today I received the book. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Thank you, Hamid, and uh, say hello to Razia and your yes, sons. Uh, her book is still under my pillow and uh, it will come for <laughs> translation too. Thank it's a beautiful book too. Thank you. And Thank have you a very day. much. Thank Bye you. now. Goodbye. Thank you. And keep safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.